Welcome everyone. This session we're going to talk about civic lotteries and ways to use lotteries to make organizations and institutions more democratic. I'd like to start off um, just by mentioning that there's probably going to be a lot of talk about diversity and representativeness by three white guys. And so to acknowledge that contradiction and that failing uh, on our part putting this panel together. Um, the other thing is that we're going to be filming this panel to be able to share on YouTube. So if you do not want to show up in that for some reason, then let us know we can accommodate that. And yeah, the, the way it's going to work is we're going to have three presentations, and then we're going to have breakout group discussions afterwards and, uh, and be able to dig into these. The first presentation is going to be from Terry Baricious, Fair Vote, looking into the history and theory behind civic lotteries. And then Chris Ellis is going to bring us into nuts and bolts practice with the citizens reference panels that he's been conducting with Mass LVP around Canada. And then I'm going to try and get us thinking about other contexts where we could and should be trying out lotteries. So, Terry. All right, so um, the, the key piece of information that we need to start with is getting uh, out of the mindset that democracy means elections. That's what most of us grew up with. That's what uh, the UN Charter of Human Rights talks about free and fair elections. And they're not the same thing. Um, the ideal of democracy is that government should make the kinds of decisions that the people as a whole would make if they had the time, motivation, resources to really dig into issue, understand them thoroughly, and a, a generally the entire population, what decision would they make? Now, we can't practically get everybody together in a society to, to spend the time to do that, so we resort to representative systems. But what John Adams wrote in 1776, that the legislature should be in miniature an exact portrait of the people at large. It should think, feel, and reason and act like them. Or Abraham Lincoln, you know, democracy is about of, by, and for the people. Now what we have come to accept is that it's actually, you know, more uh, white, older, wealthier males who are the representatives. Um, but we need to go back to the original democracy and understand that they did not rely on elections very much at all. In Athens, you'll see a word here, sortition, which we're going to talk more about. Um, all that most of us know about Athenian democracy is the assembly, the citizens' assembly. And it's referred to as a direct democracy. And people say, well, yeah, but there's nothing really relevant about that for today because uh, there, we, society's too big and we can't all gather. So therefore, we have nothing really to learn from Athens. But in fact, the Athenian democracy primarily relied on random selection to form deliberative groups. Almost all their magistrates were panels of 10 people selected at random. The juries, which could overrule the assembly, the, the court, were randomly selected. The boule, the Council of 500, which set the agenda and drafted the resolutions for the assembly to consider, was randomly selected. And in fact, in the reforms of 403 BC, the citizens' assembly in Athens got rid of all lawmaking authority out of the assembly and gave it to randomly selected legislative panels called nomothetai. These randomly selected panels were the only group that was allowed to enact new laws in Athens because they considered random selection to be key for democracy. Um, I just wanted to give a slight backup here just to my background on this. The upper corner there, that's City Burlington, Vermont City Hall. My, my history and how I came to this notion of random selection, civic lotteries or sortition, is that I was on city council back in 1981. Actually, I was elected in the same election that Bernie Sanders was elected mayor. Some of you have heard of him. And we were uh, sort of an outcast group in the city at those days. But slowly, we got more members. And I initiated this concept of citizens' assemblies, taking the New England town meeting concept of doing direct democracy. And my idea was we can do it in all the neighborhoods. This was long before the invention in, in Brazil of participatory budgeting, but it was the same concept. They would be given certain budgetary authority, making all kinds of local decisions, this ramp, these uh, open meetings. The problem was that they were not representative. It was self-selected. It was mostly 
partisan diehards that came out to these meetings, and it replicated the problems that we had in the city council, but nominally as an assembly. But it, it wasn't really, didn't feel democratic, really. And then I served 10 years to the council, and I was elected to the state legislature and the people's house, the house of representatives. And I quickly learned that this was not a representative body. It didn't look at all like the state of Vermont. It, again, it was mostly men, mostly older, mostly wealthier, better educated. And I remember we were dealing with an issue of, uh, rent, uh, of rent and landlords and tenants, and nobody in the committee was a, a tenant. And I polled the members, and as far as I, could, as I could tell, out of the 150 members in the house, there was only one renter. This body could not deliberate about landlord and tenant uh, responsibilities in a democratic way. I also worked with the League of Women Voters and Fair Vote, an organization working on election reform. But this group over here are, are Congress people, and that, that doesn't look like America, right? This is a little bit more like America. This is, this is what democracy is supposed to look like. And then I heard about this thing. Oh, while working for Fair Vote on election reform, I heard about in British Columbia, they had set up this citizens' assembly to discuss how they might reform their voting system. And they set up a citizens' assembly of one man, one woman, selected randomly from every legislative district, every riding, plus a couple of uh, uh, aboriginal uh, native people. And that body met for months on the weekends to do, to dig into issues, to really learn about them. It was genuinely representative of the population. And I only was giving them testimony for why I thought they should adopt proportional representation. But at the end of it, I said, my gosh, what they're doing is more democratic than any reform I could imagine. And so I, I often talk about how elections actually prevent deliberation uh, because they're dealing with superficial understanding of the general population. They create issues. And quite frankly, the politicians are more interested in maintaining power than solving problems. Not that they're evil people. It's just in their interests to create divisions, create enemies, say that the other side is ill-motivated, etc. So the alternative, it's got several different names. Sortition is what it's called in political science field. There are many publics, civic lotteries, jury assemblies, citizen advisory panels, randomly selected legislatures. There's a lot of different terms for the general concept, and it can be used at many different scales. But uh, the concept is that there is something crowdsourcing of ideas for coming up with good proposals. And when people don't have a partisan agenda, they are able to actually learn new information. We have a problem that uh, Citizens, when they're voting, there's something called rational ignorance, which economists have coined the phrase, where it doesn't make any sense to spend a lot of time to really learn about the issues or really dig into the, all the details of the unintended consequences of a policy, because your one vote isn't really going to make that much difference. Your one vote's probably not going to change the outcome of the election. And so voters are almost always not that well informed. And it's also true in referendums. In a, in, a, in a direct democracy, just plain vote. Most of the voters, quite frankly, are easily subject to manipulation. So the idea that we have, I'm not sure if I have another slide here or not, is this is in Australia. I, I don't want to go into great detail, but the idea of randomly selecting citizens to make policy decisions is catching on all over the world since that British Columbia rebirth. It, I mean, it has been tried on a smaller scale, citizens, juries in various places in the United States and in Spain and a lot of places have experimented with this. But it is really snowballing around the world, particularly in places like um, Belgium and uh, Spain, Ireland, where the, the constitutional amendments were initiated to a randomly selected body. And I don't want to go into the details, but just I'll, I'll stop here and pass the gavel to the next by saying that the details of how we organize randomly selected groups is crucial. It's not just a matter of getting rid of all the elected members of a legislative chamber and filling it with randomly selected people. That's not sufficient. You have to do a lot of design details to make sure that there's balance, to make sure that there's access and, and consultation with expert knowledge. Um, but 
I have to say that when push comes to shove, all the examples that we've seen around the world from China, Mongolia, Australia, Belgium, Italy, many places around the world, India, that have experimented with this, we find that average citizens, ordinary citizens, when given responsibility, they step up to that responsibility and that the quality of decision making is, in my view, far superior to that of an elected body. I'll stop there and pass the uh, clicker.